value of pi, approximately at least. So it's 3.14, 15, 92, and so on, and so on. So you probably know that pi has an infinite number of decimals. I just put 2000 on this slide. And guess what? Some people are capable of memorizing and reciting all those numbers. I can't, I'm not one of them. But I've been studying the exact same memory techniques and I'm applying them to learning Japanese Kenji. So I'm very excited to share with you the Kenji 360 experiment, a method I've been working on for the last couple of months in order to learn and remember more than 3000 Kenji. My name is Yannick Dimondo, and in case you haven't spotted it yet, I'm French. At home, we also speak Spanish because of my wife. My older daughter speaks English because we lived in Ireland and my son speaks Dutch, as we've been living in Amsterdam for the last five years. My journey with Japanese language dates back from 25 years ago, where I studied Japanese language during my engineering school, so during three years, I learned the traditional way. Then life happened, and I didn't use Japanese and forgot it. Meanwhile, in parallel, I discovered mind mapping via Tony Bison books, and then memory techniques to remember decks of playing cards, and so on. Last year, because of COVID, like many of you, I had to stay at home and accidentally I came across my old Japanese school material and I decided to revive the Japanese language. And in 2020, I bought those two books, Remember the Kanjis by James Azig and Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Four. And if we are here today, it's the results of me reading those two books, because the Kenji 360 experiment is really at the crossroads of those two words, Japanese language and memory techniques. And this will draw pretty much the agenda for this presentation. First, we spend 10 minutes on the Japanese language, then 10 minutes on the memory techniques, and finally, 25 minutes on the method itself with real examples. Let's start by the Japanese language. Japanese language has three different alphabets. Hiragana, a phonetic system similar to syllables, in green here, like mi, reru, no. Katakana, a phonetic system used mostly for foreign words, highlighted in blue here, like Mac, or here, Silicon Valley. And everything else, the kanji, unique symbols with their own meaning and adopted from the Chinese. I highlighted a few of them in red here. Hiragana and Katakana are somehow very similar. It's around 200 symbols, 100 pronunciation. Each symbol has only one single pronunciation. Simple shapes. Four strokes maximum. And both alphabets can be learned in one month if you are dedicated to it. Now, Kenji, it's a different story. There are more than 6,000 symbols, and this is actually the number you need to know if you want to pass successfully the most difficult level, the level one of the Kanken exam. There are around 300 different pronunciations. A Kenji can have several pronunciations itself, and the shapes can be simple to complex and up to 33 strokes in a single kanji. So it's not an exaggeration to say that it takes a full lifetime to master the kanjis, if it is at all possible. So what is a kanji? Let's have a look at jisho.org, a free online dictionary for one specific kanji, this one. Wow, that's a lot of information to remember. So let's break it down into various dimensions. First, you want to start by recognizing the kanji and writing it. Then, what does it mean? What are the general meanings? Then, how to read it, how to pronounce it? And finally, how can I use it with real words? So, let's dive into each. First, the meaning. A kanji can have one or several meanings, maximum five, and I would say on average two. In this example, five words are given, but that will be three different notions. Straight away directness, then honesty, frankness, and then fixing, repairing. Then the reading. Two different types of reading, the on reading and the kun reading. And a kanji can have both readings or only one of them. And for each reading, a kanji can have between zero and three different readings. So for on readings, between zero and three out of 300 different possible readings. And for the kun reading, between 0 and 3, 
out of 75 different possible readings. Then the writing. Each kanji can be seen as an aggregation of smaller parts, the components, between 1 and 4, and with around 400 different components, you can write all the kanjis. The number of strokes of a kanji is easy. It is a single number between 1 and 33. And finally, the words, which I separated into verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and compound words. So a kanji can, but it's not always the case, become a verb, an adjective, or an adverb. Let's wrap it up. Those are what I call the dimensions of a kanji, and you need to learn all of them if you want to know a kanji. All kanjis are not as complex as this one, so on average, there are about 20 bits of information to memorize for each kanji. So we know what to learn in a single kanji. The next logical question would be, how many kanjis should I learn? The Japanese Ministry of Education is publishing and maintaining various lists of kanjis to learn. First, a list of 1000 kanjis that Japanese students should learn during elementary school, from first grade to the sixth grade. Then, an additional list of, again, 1000 kanji taught in secondary school, grade 7 to grade 12. Combine, those 2136 kanjis are the famous Jōyo kanjis. And for us, non-native speakers, it is one of the main objective or important milestone to reach to be able to read around 90-95% of newspapers, websites, signs in the streets, mangas, and so on. Now, if you really want to read smoothly literature or are interested into more specialized fields, then you would probably need to add another 1000 kanji to the mix. And the consensus is around 3000 kanji to be very comfortable. Those two books cover both 3,000 kanjis, not exactly the same ones, but they probably have 99% in common. And they are my main source for my own learning. So here are my goals with the Kanji360 experiment. To learn a bit more than 3,000 kanjis, but also to learn their indexes by component structure and by own reading, using exclusively memory techniques. So what does that mean, index by component? It means that for each component, like this one in red, I want to be able to list all the kanjis which are using this component. And similarly for the reading on, for one syllable, here, ka, I want to be able to list all the kanjis pronounced ka. So it is quite an ambitious goal, kind of learning a dictionary with its indexes. Okay, let's review together the current method to learn kanjis. For this, let's make a quadrant and draw two axes. Horizontally, the usage of memory techniques, and vertically, the usage of technology. Immersion is the first option. If you live in Japan, listen to Japanese podcasts all day long, watch Japanese TV, read kanji signs on the streets, well, I'm sorry to say that it will not work for kanji acquisition, or very slowly. I'm sure you will pick up the language and eventually speak it and understand it very well, but you will not be able to master the kanjis. And I know from my personal experience dozens of people living in Japan after many years in such a situation. Then, rote memorization. Probably the most widespread technique. And good news, it works. It really works. It's painful, but eventually it will work if you are dedicated. Now the flashcards. It's becoming more technological since you are introducing an element of organization and optimization in your learning process. I assume you are familiar with the concept. You have a set of cards with a question and an answer on the other side, and you quiz yourself with those cards. And finally, systems with a strong layer of technology, the SRS, Spaced Repetition Systems. Very similar to flashcards, with an algorithm that optimizes the interval of repetitions of the cards based on your previous answers. Specifically for Japanese, I can recommend Enki or Kitsune.io, a more recent one. Both have various decks for Japanese kanjis. Now moving on on the right side, let's investigate the systems which are using mnemonics. But first, what are mnemonics? Those are techniques, tools, which help for the storage and retrieval of information by doing associations with something that you, the learner, already know. 
For instance, to remember the number of days in each month, you can use your two hands. Mnemonics are used in language acquisition and in Japanese. First, the books. If you search on Google for kanji mnemonics, you will find several ones. I already presented earlier the red and the green here in the background. I have this third one in Spanish, kanji is in vignettas. A very interesting concept, since they are using text mnemonics, but also drawings. Then we have the websites. They are very similar to the books. Main advantage being the search capability, particularly this one from Reinhard Albrecht, where you can search by own reading, by coon reading, by meaning, by skip code, etc. etc. And now the more advanced quadrant, systems using both technology and mnemonics. Two very good resources, which I am using at least weekly, kanji.koi.com and wanikani.com. One is free, the other is not. Those websites are focused on kanji acquisition through mnemonics and are using a SRS algorithm to optimize the learning process. And finally, we have websites which are even more complete with a broader scope of lessons. Not only kanji with mnemonics and spaced repetition system, but also grammar, audio files, pronunciation, speech accent, quiz, games, and so on. Obviously, they are not free, but the learning material is really top. Okay, so if memory techniques are already used for Japanese learning, what do I bring new on the table? I promise I will answer these questions in a few slides, but first I want to introduce to you the memory techniques. And that will lead us to our second part of the presentation. Let me present you Akira Haraguchi, the man who learned 100,000 digits of the number pi. Wow, that's quite a performance, and it took him 16 hours to recite all numbers. What is interesting is how he did it. It's not by rote memorization. He used a specific memory technique, associating each digit with a Japanese syllable then making stories from the words produced by the syllables. So this is incredible, and there are other great people doing similar things. They are called memory athletes, and they have their own world championships every year, where they have to recall hundreds of numbers, words, names, faces, playing cards, binary numbers, etc. But are those mental athletes that extraordinary? Well, no. Actually, they are normal people, like you, and me, and using techniques known for centuries, if not millennia. But don't get me wrong, what they are doing is truly amazing, and they did put an extraordinary amount of work in designing, learning, practicing, perfecting their own memory systems. Here is an overview of the various memory techniques, and in the Kanji 360 experiment, we'll use a combination of some of them in order to memorize Kanji. So, why does it work? Actually, you could just trust those memory athletes, because they are the living proof that it simply works. But it is also backed by science, and particularly neurosciences, since we are just starting to better understand this fantastic organ, the brain. So I don't pretend this slide to be scientific, and I will only light a few notions. So here's a model proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin more than 50 years ago. Important caveat, it is just a model. It's not the exact truth of what's happening in our brain. And there's even been criticism of that model and new models proposed since. Yet, I thought it would be beneficial for us in the context of that video to present it in order to give an overview. So three stages, sensory, short-term, and long-term memory. Sensory, what your senses perceive from the world. Short-term, some bits of information around seven plus or minus two that you can remember for a few seconds, up to 20 seconds, and then long-term, what you permanently know. And for Japanese language acquisition, what we want to achieve is long-term memory of the kanji. In order to optimize this, we want to improve the encoding, here in green, so placing an information from our short-term to long-term memory, and we want to improve as well the other way around, the retrieval, taking information from our long-term and placing it into our short-term memory in order to use it in a specific situation. So how to improve the initial encoding? The best is to respect the memory principles as depicted by this mind map I took from Tony Bison. Our brain is designed to better remember information whenever those principles are being respected. And actually, you see them daily 
put into practice through advertising where brands are trying to put into your brand all their products. So when learning a kanji, we will make sure to reuse some of those principles in order to maximize the encoding process. Now, the retrieval and rehearsal. This is the forgetting curve proposed by Ebbinghaus in the 19th century, showing that the retention of information is rapidly decreasing with time. By rehearsing several times, we want to keep the information at a high retention rate. And what a SRS system does is just optimizing this interval of recall so that it's not too often and not too late. Now, let's apply those memory techniques to Kenji learning. We start from the dimensions of the Kenji. And for each dimension, we will apply a specific memory technique. For the meaning, we will use the chain linking and story method. For the on reading, we will use the sound alike technique and the category of fictional characters. For the Kuhn reading, the person, action, object technique, based on real human beings. For the components, the chunking method, with various objects and concepts. For the number of strokes, the alphabet peg system, based on musical instruments. For the verbs, the sound alike technique, based on countries. For the adjectives, the same sound alike technique, based on food, this time. And for adverbs, the sound alike technique based on real or fictional animals. And finally, for the compound words, the memory palace technique. And then we'll take all this and integrate it into a movie. A movie with a title, a poster, a story, and even final credits. And this is the added value of the Kanji 360 experiment. Its originality. It is a system completely integrated. Existing methods are based on mnemonics, which tackle only one or two dimensions, but not all of those ones here. And they lack the integration into a coherent, bigger system, which actually helps in the initial encoding first, and then future recalls. The system is quite rich, and today, for sake of time, we will focus only on some of the dimensions and the story. But there's even more, and Having an integrated system, rather than just a few mnemonic, open many possibilities. So I'm just giving you a glimpse of what else the method entails, which we will not discuss. The house of Kenji, the Kenji radar, the compound cube, the words landscape, the brand and sound indicators. Okay, that's all for the theory. Now let's go in detail for each dimension of the Kenji, and let's start by the on reading. The question is, what is or what are the different on reading for this kanji? Let's work on a few examples. The technique is sound alike and the category fictional characters. This first kanji is pronounced ka, and in my system, for that sound ka, I decided to choose the fictional character from Marvel, Captain America. It starts by the sound ka, it ends by the sound ka, so the association between the sound and the fictional character is quite logical. And then, for that kanji, I will build a story where Captain America will play a role. So every time the on reading of a kanji will be ka, I will use Captain America. Which means there will be eventually many different stories with Captain America. Let's move forward with other examples. For the sound kun, I'm using the character Plo Koon from Star Wars. For the sound ten, I am using Tinkerbell from Walt Disney. And for the sound June, I'm using Dumbo Jumbo from Walt Disney. So I am taking a few liberties in terms of pronunciation, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't create any interference. Remember that you are creating the system for yourself, not for others. So this is not a problem as long as you are aware of your initial choice and you stick to it. I hope you understand the concept. Now let's see an interesting case, the short versus long syllable. This is a frequent problem for Japanese language learners. How do I remember if it is a short or long syllable? For the short Ryo, I'm using the character Super Mario from Nintendo. While for the long Ryo, I'm using the character Ryo from a video game. Similarly, for the short sound Ro, I'm using Robin from Detective Comics Batman. While for the long Ro, I am using Robocop. Again, this is a personal choice. 
I decided to make these associations of long Ro with Robocop, but you could choose Mario for the long Rio sound if you prefer, as long as you stay consistent with your own choice, that is fine. So this is my code. One on-reading dimension is associated with one fictional character. You may remember that there are around 300 different sounds for the on-readings, so indeed, I had to identify 300 fictional characters in order to build my own code. It took me quite a while, I had to be creative sometimes, but it is not that difficult and it's actually quite fun to do. Okay, so we've just seen the on-reading dimension. And now we're going to tackle the second one, the coon reading. But for this, I need to introduce you to a specific memory method called the person action object, the PAO. The objective is to convert a number into a mental image of someone doing something based on a predefined code. It is used for the memorization of decks of playing cards, random long numbers, sequence of binary digits. It's usually a two-digit system, meaning numbers between 00 and 99, but it can be extended to a three-digit system, so numbers between 000 and 999. What can you do with one mental image? Well, you can remember six digits number, or nine binary digits, or three playing cards, and all this in the right order of digits of cards. Now, let's have a look at how the system works. So it all starts with an initial code that you have to build yourself, just like we built our own code for the own reading previously. For all numbers between 00 and 99, you have to associate this number with one person doing an action with an object. So look at that table for those three numbers. For the number 15, the person is Albert Einstein. The action is a writing and the object is a blackboard. For the number 16, the person is Arnold Schwarzenegger. The action is lifting and the objects are weights. And for the number 33, the person is Charlie Chaplin. The action is swinging and the object is a cane. Now, imagine you want to remember the number 151,633. First step, breaking it into two digit numbers, 15, 16, 33. Then, taking the person of 15, the action of 16, and the object of 33. And finally, you just read the sentence. The number translates into Albert Einstein lifting a cane. Can you see this image of the old Albert Einstein with his beard and gray hair lifting a cane? Maybe he's sweating it super hard because the cane is super big and heavy. Or on the contrary, he's lifting the cane very easily because it's quite light. What's important is to create a mental image that speaks to you so that you can remember it more easily. And guess what? In one hour, you will still remember this mental image. But you will have completely forgotten the six digit number 151633. And then, if you want to recreate the six-digit number from the mental image, you just have to decode this mental image back to its original format of numbers by doing the reverse operation using your initial code. The person Albert Einstein means the number 15, the action lifting means the number 16, and the object Kane means the number 33. If you know your initial code very well and you have practiced it a lot, then the coding and decoding takes very, very little time. It's quite automatic. Let's go faster for the second example. 163,315. Person of 16, action of 33, object of 15, Arnold Schwarzenegger swinging a blackboard. And for the third example, 33, 15, 16. Can you guess what it is? I think you understood. Okay, nice, but what's the relation with Japanese language and kanji acquisition? Well, we will use a PAO system, but instead of two digits to remember a number, we will use syllables to remember words. So let's see for this kanji. Its kun pronunciation is a, bu, ra. So that's three syllables. So we'll take the person associated to the syllable a, the action of bu, and the object of ra. And in my system, this three syllables word becomes the following mental image, Amelia doing kung fu moves in a wedding dress. I know, that was quick, and that was probably the most difficult part of the presentation. I hope I didn't lose you, gambate gorasai, but anyway, it's okay. Just follow the link indicated here below and you will find more information.
Let's see now what it means for the Kenji 360 method. The question is what is or what are the Kun reading for these Kenji? Let's work on a few examples. The technique will be person, action, object, based on real human beings. So this Kenji is pronounced Kuwa, two syllables, Ku and Wa, and will take the person of Ku, Kun Elizabeth in my system, and the action of Walt Disney, drawing. And since there are only two syllables, we will not use any object. So Kuwa becomes Queen Elizabeth drawing. When learning this kanji, I will create a story in which Queen Elizabeth will be drawing something. And if you are curious, the own reading of this kanji is actually Ka. So in that very same story, we will have Queen Elizabeth drawing on paper while discussing with her political advisor, Captain America, on various topics. Second example, E, ra, the notion of choosing, electing, preferring. E, that's Eminem for me. Ara, Rachel Green, and her action, crying. So Era becomes Eminem crying. Just like for the own readings, I am taking some liberties for the pronunciations. I'm French, so for me it makes sense to pronounce Rachel with the sound Ara. And in real life, years ago, I've been to a reading of a French friend of mine named Rachel. So these associations of Ara, Rachel crying, wedding dress, is very strong for me. But if you are coming from an English-speaking country, most probably you would prefer to associate Rachel with the sound Re and find another association for the sound Ra. Let's have a deeper look at the example from the previous slide. A bu Ra. A, this is Amelia Earhart, the famous aviation pioneer from the early 20th century. Bu, it's coming from Bruce Lee, Burusuri in Japanese, and is doing Kung Fu moves very quickly. And Ra, Rachel Green, with her object from the code, a wedding dress. So, Abura becomes Amelia Earhart doing Kung Fu moves in a wedding dress. So this is the code for the Kun reading. For one syllable, we will associate one person, or one action, or one object. In my system, in order to avoid uh, interferences, I voluntarily made a strong distinction between the on reading and the Kun reading having both the technique and also the category different. For the own reading, I am using fictional characters, cartoon-like, superheroes, superpowers. While for the Kun reading, I'm using real human beings or fictional ones. So at that stage, we have seen the own readings and the Kun readings, and that's already a lot. I will go much faster for the other dimensions because they are much easier to understand. Now let's focus on the components of the kanji. The questions, how is structured this kanji and how can I remember each part? This is based on the chunking memory technique where we divide the target information into various chunks of information, simpler and or already known. The best is to think about it as Lego blocks or atoms and molecules. So you start learning simple components. And by combining those simple components, you create new kanjis, more complex, in form and strokes. So it is a process that builds on itself, and you must have learned the simpler components before tackling the kanjis with more complex components. The system has been developed by James Isaac 30 years ago, then used and refined by many people over the world. So there's no doubt that it works. But like everything, it comes with pros and cons. And one of the disadvantages of this method is that you do not learn kanjis by frequency or importance. You may learn very early in the process some kanjis which are simple but very rarely used. On the contrary, some very important kanjis used very frequently are introduced much later due to their complexity. Anyway, let's proceed and take a few more examples. The kanjis on the left seems difficult, but if you look carefully, various components are reused several times. So this one, on reading Gaku and Kun reading Take around the notions of peak, high point of a mountain. Actually, it's made of two components, meaning respectively hill and mountain. And if you're really curious, the component hill can actually be decomposed itself into two smaller components, the hacks and the ground. Anyway, for this kanji, the story involves John Travolta, my character for the Kun reading Ta, as an alpinist coming from a hill and then climbing a mountain asking if the peak is still far away because he's getting tired, etc, etc. Now the strokes. The question, 
how many strokes for this kanji. We'll use the alphabet peg system method based on musical instruments. For instance, when a kanji has four strokes, we will select an instrument starting with the fourth letter of the alphabet, the letter D. In my code, this is the didgeridoo. And then, in each story, we will include a reference to this instrument, either the instrument itself, one of the characters playing that instrument, or smashing it on the ground, or using it to perform any kind of action, or there will be background music, a soundtrack, a melody, played with this instrument. So I suppose you get it, five strokes is the electric guitar for me, six the transverse flute, with F, eight is the harmonica, or the harp, and so on. This is the Kenji 360 code, for a single number of strokes, we associate one instrument. Now the verbs. Can this kanji become a verb? What is the infinitive form of a verb? And what is the verbal form ending of the infinitive? Maybe I should explain what is a verb ending, as it is not a grammatical notion per se. For me, it is simply whatever comes after the kanji is written in hiragana and eventually ends by the sound u. So let's check it on this table. The verb endings are all the hiragana marked in bold. Okay, so moving on, for verbs, we will use the sound-alike technique based on countries. What does that mean? Here's the kanji illustrating the notion of giving, performing, and also alms. The verb is hodoko su, so ending by the sound su. And in my code, I associated this sound su with the country Spain, because in Japanese, you pronounce it su pe in. So in this story, there's a pod race, a la Star Wars, with Sebulba taking place in the bullring, the Plaza de Toros de Sevilla. So when I recall the story, I see vividly the Plaza de Toros, hence I know that the verb ending is su. So this is the method, including a reference to the specific country, like a flag, a famous place, playing the national anthem, characters wearing the traditional costume, etc. Second example, Kaeru and Kaesu. That's an interesting case, with two different verbs endings. So in my story, there will be references to those two countries. For instance, one of the characters could be a Russian Tsar, and he wants to invade Spain. A few more examples, and as you can see, those are only personal choices when building my own code initially. I decided to associate Gu to Guyana. It could have been Guatemala, U with Uruguay, but why not Ukraine or Uganda? It's really up to you to adapt. So this is the code, one verbal form ending, being associated with one country. I will go very fast for the next two dimensions, as it is the exact same technique and just changing the category. So for adjectives, the main question, what is the adjective ending after the kanji? Let's check it on a few examples where the ending is marked in bold. The technique will be the sound alike, just like the verbs, but with the category of food. Every time an adjective ends in e, we will use smoked eels in that story. For the ending roshi, a roasted chicken, and for the sound shi, some shrimps. So in each movie, we will include a reference to this specific food. One adjective ending, one food. And finally, the adverbs, with the same sound alike technique and using the category of animals. And I mean a living animal, not a dead one used as food, in order to avoid any potential interference with the adjectives. Whenever the adverb ending is da, I'm using a Dalmatian in that story. For the sound gu, an iguana, and for the sound chini, a sea urchin. So I'm sure you got it by now. The code is simply one adverb ending associated with one animal. Here we are, finally, to the most exciting part of the presentation. So let's take an example and build the story together, reproducing the exact steps. So I'm going to show you now how I'm building the story for a kanji, this one here. And for sake of time, we will just focus on the story. And it's important, I highlight a few points before so that you better understand the concept. First, the story is the core of the method. This is where I spend most of my time. And it's not a five minutes work to create a good story with action, dialogues, humor, a beginning, an end, a climax, some drama, maybe some funny facts, and all this in a coherent way. Then the story must be visualized in your brain. So it's not about writing or reading a text, it's about visualizing a movie with all these special effects, sounds, characters, actions, colors, and so on. The story must include all dimensions of a kanji, 
meanings, readings, writing, the verbs, adjectives, adverbs, compounds, as many as possible. The story must reuse as many memory principles to improve the encoding and make the future recalls easier. The story is used when initially learning the kanji, that's the first encoding, but is also replayed when doing the revisions. And then something magical happens, the story will evolve. It is a very dynamic process, and chances are you will never play the same story exactly identically at each rehearsal. It's similar to the post-production on the film. You cut something you don't like, you change the order of scenes, you rearrange the scripts, you add a few more special effects, and so on and so on. And all this to improve the retention of the target information, the dimensions of the kanji you are learning. And finally, the title, poster, and credits come after the story and evolve with it. So let's dive in. First step, I go to jisho.org and I look at the various dimensions of the kanji. Step two, I identify all elements of those dimensions corresponding to my code. So on reading, kin and con, so that is kingpin and donkey kong. Kun reading, chica, so Winston Churchill and Carl Lewis. First component, road, and a road. Second component, axe, hence an axe. I spot an adjective, chikai, ending in e, so we need some eels. An adverb without any specific ending, so we need the anemon. A verb ending in zuku, hence the flag of Uzbekistan. Seven strokes, hence an acoustic guitar. And finally, a diving board, an octopus, and a quicksilver logo. I know we didn't have time to study this, so just believe me, there's a reason why, and it helps. And step three, creating a story from all the elements above in order to illustrate the notion of the kanji, near, early, proximity, akin. So here we go for the story, with the legend here on the right to help identifying the various dimensions of the kanji. So the action takes place in Uzbekistan, flags are floating in the air. On the left, a road leading to the Aral Sea, with very little water left and very old rusty boats on the sand. Coming from the right side of the scene, Winston Churchill is running with quicksilver sports outfits. Churchill stops abruptly when an axe hits the ground just in front of him. The kingpin appears on the road with another axe in his hands, and close to him, Donkey Kong is playing the acoustic guitar. Don't come any closer! How dare you? I have to join the road to take some heels in the sea. Are you short-sighted or what? There's no more water in that sea. King Ping takes off a lens from his eye and throws it to Churchill. Do you need my corrective lenses for me, Opa? Maybe to better see the situation? In the recent years, too many people took water. Just recently, other people came just like you. It has to stop. Okay, well, listen. I own a modern restaurant in the suburbs of Tashkent, and in a few days, I have a wedding to prepare for my guest, and I need those eels. But you don't get it, do you? Soon there will be nothing left. I won't let you take more resources. Don't you have any affinity for this planet? Well, saving the planet? No, actually. I'm sorry, it's nearly 7 o'clock, and I don't have time to discuss anymore. I will take a shortcut, if you don't mind. Churchill climbs a giant diving board and jumps over the kingpin to land on the Aral Sea. Kingpin throws him a few more axes, which Churchill avoids swiftly. Churchill fishes an octopus, some eels and two anemones. Then Churchill uses a high jump pole to pass over the kingpin again and he goes all the way back to the right side of the scene. Kingpin is very angry and yells at him. Next time I will call my associates and if I see you again in the neighborhood, I will kill you. You'd better keep away from me. Donkey Kong throws his acoustic guitar at Churchill and shouts, I condemn you to be banished! What you heard was just the transcription of the story with a narrator, a dialogue between various characters, and some basic, basic sound effects. And I fear that's really the best that I can do. But what I have in mind is much stronger, much more vivid, and that's exactly what I meant in the previous slide by you have to visualize the story in your mind. Let me add a few comments to clarify. First, 
The title I came up for that story is Don't come any closer or I'll ax you in seven pieces. So I imagine Kingpin saying that sentence in a threatening way very loudly. And maybe you spotted in this title a few references to some of the dimensions. Come closer, that's one of the meaning. Ax, that's one of the components. And seven, the number of strokes. So this is a good title because it helps as a trigger to recall the full story. Finally, an important note about the words. The objective is not to learn the words in Japanese at that stage. For that, I have another technique. I briefly mentioned the words landscape based on the memory palace technique. No, no, here it's really about using different words in order to reinforce the various meanings of the kanji. And the story becomes a place where I hang more vocabulary words when I meet them. For instance, those are additional words that I will add in that story at some point later on. And yes, this story will evolve. So at that stage, I think the key question is, does that work? Let's see the pros, starting first with general benefits. If you follow that path into memory techniques, you will discover a fabulous word, the heart of memory, and probably surprise yourself seeing how powerful your brain can be when using the right tools. Then culture. I spent hours on Wikipedia reading about countries, animals, history, famous people, places, music that I was just not aware of before. And I think I developed a better sense of curiosity and became more open to the world. Imagination then. Having to create stories while respecting all dimensions of the kanjis is a very good exercise of creativity under constraints. And number four, it's really fun, and we should not underestimate this benefit. We come from rote memorization, something tedious and highly repetitive, and we make it a fun and creative process instead. Now the benefits from the Japanese language perspective. First, learning all meanings of a kanji, in context, so it's not a one-to-one -one pairing. And that's key, usually you will learn one single word with a flashcard, for instance. Then, it helps in writing. First with a number of strokes, no more guess. But also a side effect on a problem very familiar for all Japanese learners. Visually similar kanjis. They suddenly become very easy to differentiate because the stories are completely different. The vocabulary is reinforced by appearing in several stories under different contexts. Then the verbs. I've always found it very difficult to guess the infinitive form of a verb. And in my system, with flags and countries, it really makes it super easy. And as we've seen earlier, the story becomes the place where to store additional information. And now let's tackle the sensitive part, the cons. First, it is an experiment still going on. I've done around 5 to 10% so far, so it's too little a sample and probably just too soon to draw definitive conclusions. Then it focuses only on kanji acquisition, but obviously there is much more to the full Japanese language than just kanjis. Then, it's not yet exhaustive, in the sense that I'm still lacking information on some dimensions of the kanji, like the strokes order, the calligraphy, is it hane, tome, harai, the pitch accent, the etymology, and maybe others. And can it even become exhaustive? Then, it's not a scientific approach. It's just one person, me, at his desk, no control group, no success criteria defined in advance, etc. Maybe in the coming years, once completely ready, I could try to find some volunteers to test it at a larger scale, who knows? Undoubtedly, the main concern is the time investment. Initially, building the code and memorizing it will probably take you a couple of weeks. So it's not the fastest path because this initial time could have been used directly into Japanese language itself. And then, time to create powerful stories and it can take me up to three hours, spread over a couple of days or weeks, to create one single story. Good news anyway, this time is not wasted, because somehow the hesitations, the back and forth, all this, it helps to reinforce the initial encoding of the kanji. Now, is it possible to remember 3000 stories? I can testify it works well for 300 stories so far, but 10 times more, I just don't know it yet. Then. Is it even an efficient strategy to try to create stories for all kanjis? Shouldn't it be only a backup strategy used only for difficult kanjis instead? Another drawback, 
I feel cannot be fully documented in written format because of potential copyright issues. I'm using characters from Marvel, Disney, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Nintendo, and it's okay for this video falling under the fair use. But a blog, a book, or a podcast, I'm not sure. Then, I'm using this method to learn Japanese right now, but I doubt I could use it to learn Russian at the same time. It may create too many interferences. And final remark, despite using powerful encoding, repetition and SRS are still needed. And that is probably something we could have guessed earlier. The best solution is to have a mix of both, a strong encoding via memory techniques and a strong rehearsal process via the use of spaced repetition systems. Balancing the pros and the cons, I would say it's a great method if you are generally curious in life and thinking more long-term rather than having a quick win mentality. So here we are, time to conclude this video. I hope you liked it and enjoyed it as much as I did. I started this video with this slide, but maybe I should actually turn it into a question because this is an experiment. Will I be successful? I don't know. But that doesn't really matter because at the end, it's not that much about the destination, but more about the journey. Thanks for your attention. Sayonara.